Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, talking about the Feast of Weeks and what exactly we're all supposed to do on the Feast of Weeks. And in this video, we're going to be looking in the book of Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Jubilees, and other books that gives details on the Feast of Weeks, what it is, and what we're supposed to do. And then I'm going to talk about my own personal testimony and what I experienced during the Feast of Weeks. So let's get started. Now, the first book that we'll look in is the book of Jubilees in chapter six, which gives us details on the institution of the Feast of Weeks and the history of its observance. Now, we've covered these verses in many videos, so we'll only pull out the highlights here starting in verses 15, 16, and 17, which is pretty much telling us that the Feast of Weeks is for the renewing of the covenant. That's why you hear people call the Feast of Weeks the Covenant Festival. And in our class that we did yesterday, we looked through scripture to see how Abraham, Moses, the disciples, and even Jacob all had covenant type interactions with our father on or during the Feast of Weeks. Now, one thing that should be brought out that we see in verse 18 is the relationship of the Noahic covenant and eating of the blood. Notice that after Noah died, his children stopped keeping the Feast of Weeks, as you see there in verse 18, and they started eating with the blood again. Then notice in verse 19 that Abraham observed the Feast of Weeks along with his son Isaac and Jacob. But then after the Feast of Weeks, like after the death of Noah, the children of Israel stopped keeping the Feast of Weeks and didn't start again until the days of Moses, which we read about in the first chapter and the first verse of this same book. Now, well, let's come down to verse 21 which says that the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of first fruits, this feast is twofold and of a double nature, meaning that there's two reasons behind the Feast of Weeks. One was for the renewal of the covenant, like what we saw back up in verse 17. And the other nature of the Feast of Weeks, we see down in verse 22, when it's talking about sacrifices and offerings. The two reasons for the Feast of Weeks are to renew the covenant and one day it will be for the descending of the new covenant but the other reason for the feast of weeks is to pay tithes and offerings to the lord now let's come over to the book of deuteronomy chapter 16 and we'll start at verse 10 which says and thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the lord thy god with a tribute of a free will offering of that hand now this is the part of the second reason for the feast of weeks that we read about and that is this free will offering here now when i read the scripture way back in 1995 for the first time and i was hearing about all of these festival days i was convinced that these were no more than holy barbecues or family get-togethers on these specific days and this is what it's talking about here when it's talking about a free will offering so the Feast of Pentecost is a time to pay tribute. And it says, which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God, according as the Lord thy God has blessed thee. So now the way this all works, you have to remember that the Feast of Weeks is a harvest celebration. And in today's economy, where most people aren't involved in agriculture, this doesn't really make sense. But if you see the father working with you and blessing you in other areas besides agriculture, then it is of those other areas that you will make your free will offering on the Feast of Pentecost. Then look at verse 11 and says, Thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant and thy maidservant and the Levite that is within thy gates and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow that are among you in the place which the Lord thy God has chosen to place his name there. So what this is talking about is a celebration here, a family get together of sorts with fun, friends, family, food, and our father in celebration of this festival day. That's what the free will offerings are for. 
if it were not required for these people to bring this food in, you can imagine that there would have been times that they would have been having these get togethers, but there would have been no food involved. But anyway, let's peep over at Proverbs chapter three and verse nine. Honor the Lord thy God of thy substance and with the first fruits of all thy increase. This is one of the ways that we celebrate the Feast of Pentecost is by sharing with others, sharing what the Father has blessed us with. And looking back over at Deuteronomy chapter 16, we see all of these people that we're supposed to invite to our holy convocation on Pentecost. So the way this all works is we bring these people in. Everybody who lives within our gates, as well as the poor, the widows, the fatherless, and the stranger to partake in this festival. So this is why I say many of these festivals, including Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks, is like a family get together because you have all of these people here celebrating on this particular day with all of this food and rejoicing. So let's jump over here and let's look at the book of Tobit, talking about Tobias where we see that his dad, Tobiel, is returning from a journey during the Feast of Weeks. It says in verse 2, Then during the reign of Ezrahajan, I returned home, and my wife Anna and my son Tobias were restored to me at our festival of Pentecost, which is the sacred festival of weeks. A good dinner was prepared for me, and I reclined to eat it. Now, as far as an example of what we are supposed to do during the Feast of Pentecost, we see that Anna has prepared a goodly meal for Tobiel at his return. So this lets us know that this was a big dinner celebration, like we said earlier, with food and family. But then notice in verse two, it says, when the table was set for me and an abundance of food placed before me, I said to my son Tobias, go my child and bring whatsoever poor person you may find of our people among the exiles in Nineveh, who is wholeheartedly mindful of God, and he shall eat together with me. I will wait for you until you come back. So here is Tobias being sent out into the community to find the poor, the widows, the Levites, the exiles, to bring them back to this dinner celebration. Now, another document that I will submit for evidence is the book of Josephus. Now, I know this is not scriptural text, and we could tell that because of the errors that it has in it. But in the Antiquities chapter 10 and verse 6, we could see Josephus's account of what they were actually doing in celebration of the Feast of Weeks. You see here, it says, they bring to God a loaf made of wheat flour of two tenth deals with leaven, and for sacrifices they bring two lambs. See, now the way I understand this, back in the day, like we were saying, everybody was into agriculture. So you had plenty of people who were raising lambs, and what they would do before the Feast of Pentecost is they would run them under the what they call the tithing gate, where they would count the sheep, and every tenth animal that passed under this gate would be holy and would be part of this sacrifice that they would make. And on the Feast of Pentecost, they would haul all of these animals down to Jerusalem and donate them to the priests, who would then prepare a meal for themselves and the rest of the people there to enjoy the Pentecost celebration. You see here where Josephus says, and must slay the sacrifices in order to feast upon them. This was the main reason for all of these sacrifices that were made back in the day. This was actually food that the people were eating on these festival days. Now, let's come over to the book of Leviticus in chapter 23. Starting in verse 15 is where we start to hear about the Feast of Weeks. But it's down in about verse 17 that we see what it is that we're supposed to do. And it says that we're supposed to bring out out of our habitations two ways loaves of bread made with fine flour. Again, reminded us of the harvest celebration nature of these festivals and how back in the day before the 1800s, when people started taking on jobs and were growing their own wheat, they will make bread out of a portion of that harvest and they will bring that bread to this festival. 
So now you have bread and you have lamb and other things that are offered for this celebration. To me, this all sounds like a big cookout. Now, you're looking in verse 18, where it goes on talking about these offerings that are to be made. And you have to remember that this would have been the actions of the Levites and the priests. It was the common man that brought these animals in for the priests to make these sacrifices. These are what's called offerings made by fire. And I know this kind of freaks people out when they start hearing about sacrifices and all of this stuff. But again, you have to remember that this was actually food. When you look closely at the scripture and how these sacrifices were supposed to take place, most of them, especially the free will type, the part of the animal that was actually burned or sacrificed to the Lord was the part that I believe he didn't want us eating, like the visceral fat and the kidneys, which we know are bad for you. Well, those are the parts of the animal that we are instructed to burn up on the altar. So imagine. You have just dispatched a lamb and you're about to start processing this animal for eating. But there are certain parts, this fat and this kidneys, we are expected to throw on the fire of the altar. But guess what they did with the rest of the animal? Yep, that's right. They ate it. So it's really the word only that's off-putting when you say sacrifice. But you have to understand that anytime an animal is killed, that animal has been sacrificed. The only question is, was it sacrificed according to the scripture where the fat and the kidneys are burned on the altar? Now, that's the reason why I try not to buy meat from the store because I'm almost absolutely sure they're not sacrificing the fat when they are slaughtering these animals, especially when I see them not even working to get the blood out. But anyway, let's come back to Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 20 when it's talking about how the priests are supposed to make this wave offering. So here you have brought your bread in for the priest and all he does with it is wave it as if to present it before the Lord. And then he puts it with the rest of the materials that have been donated. That's what it means in verse 20 when it says they shall be holy to the Lord for the priests. The feast of Pentecost is a time in which we are supposed to bless the priests with our increase. That's who actually receives these offerings, the priests. And that's how they support their family is when we make our tithes and our offerings. Now, I should have asked you guys to break out a pencil on a piece of paper because I know these details are a little bit scattered. But when you look down in verse 21, we see that the Feast of Pentecost is actually a day when we're not supposed to do any servile work. And servile work can be defined as the work of a servant or the work of a slave. But notice that it does not include all kinds of work. Again, verse 21 is telling us that this is a holy convocation, which means that we're inviting everybody in to celebrate this festival like Tobiel did when he sent his son Tobit out into the community. Then you notice that verse 22 goes on to tell you how you're supposed to treat your field. Well, remember, these are harvest celebrations. So I believe what this is telling us is that once we do this correctly, then we can expect an abundance of crops in our field. Like in the book of Ruth, we are supposed to share this with those that are less fortunate. But now let's get into my own personal testimony and what happened to me around Pentecost in the year 2015. Now, if you watch many of our videos, especially the ones when I give my testimony, you know that it was in 2015 that the father first put on my heart to get rebaptized. I had been baptized before, but I didn't understand the reason behind it. And I defiled that baptism and was in need of being baptized again. And my wife and I did so in about February of 2015. And immediately after that, our father put on my heart that we were supposed to keep the feast of Passover with bread and wine, just like the Messiah did with the disciples at the Last Supper. So that was the first year that we actually had the communion on Passover. But we were very familiar with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So we were good there as far as removing the leavening from the house and partaking in only the scripture. But 
in 2015, I really didn't understand the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost and what we were supposed to do on that holiday. So I basically did nothing. Matter of fact, I really didn't even know when the Feast of Pentecost was in 2015 because I was following the Jewish calendar at the time. Well, to my surprise, when I go back to my Facebook account, which is where my ministry primarily was back in 2015, I see that all of a sudden on June the 2nd in 2015, I started posting about the covenant. Now, I searched all through my Facebook history and it's true that for some reason, and I know what that reason is now, that all of a sudden on June the 2nd, even though I wasn't aware that it was Pentecost at all, and didn't know what I was supposed to be doing on the Feast of Pentecost, I had a visitation from the Father by way of the Holy Spirit that put on my heart the covenant. And from that moment on, I started researching and studying the Father's covenant, which is Exodus chapter 20 through 24, verse 7. And ever since then, I believe I've had his laws on my heart. So the point of all of this is that even though I didn't know what Pentecost was or when it was, the only thing that I could look to say that I did right was taking off from work on that particular day because I had already left the industry and was already working towards the hillbilly homestead. Taking off work was the only thing that I believed that I got right that year. But still, our father put the covenant on my heart. So the way I believe this all works is that we are purified in the first month where we start preparing our temples for the new covenant. And we receive that new covenant in the third month during the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. And to aid us in that spiritual change, we make sacrifices to the priests and the less fortunate. Now, here you see an image from our bread that we made in 2018. By then, we have started filling some of the increase that's supposed to result from these harvest festivals. And for the first time, we actually got to make bread out of wheat that we had grown out there in the field. And you see back then, we had our wine to go with our bread. And you see my horn there, which we know that we are supposed to blow the horn on every festival day. And we see in the pot there, the offering made by fire. So this was our Pentecost meal in the year of 2018, which consisted of the two loaves of bread for the first time. And this is what it looked like in 2020, which by then we had learned to make our own wine. And that what you see here is made from blackberries. But you notice that the two loaves don't look quite the same. Well, that's because of COVID-19 and there was a lack of yeast on the shelves. We tried to make our loaves of bread out of sourdough, but they didn't rise. But anyway, we tried. That goes to show that it's not necessary that we actually get everything absolutely correct. The point is that we remember these days and treat them like holy convocations every year. Now, it should be brought out that these two loaves of bread have to be made with leaven. Normally, no leaven is allowed in the festivals, but... The Feast of Weeks is different because we are required to have leavening. So whereas during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we were to remove all leavening from our house, which we understand to be the church doctrine. And now we are coming out of our house with new leavening. So the way I understand that is that we remove the church doctrine during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And for the next 50 days, our father is working with us introducing his doctrine. So on Pentecost, we are to present this new understanding that our father has revealed to us. Now, this makes perfect sense for those of you who partook in the feast of Passover for the first time, because you will have a bunch of new revelations as far as our father and his scripture is concerned. So you will have plenty of leavened bread to share with the rest of us. So maybe you should consider finding an outlet for these new understandings. So what do you do on Pentecost? 
have a cookout, invite the poor and the widows and the Levites to come join you. Do all of your preparation work on the 14th day of the month and serve your guests on the 15th day of the month and try to find a quiet place on the 16th day of the month, just in case our father comes to visit you to talk about the covenant. Now, if you have any questions or concerns or anything, please put them in the comment section below. We still read all of the comments that you guys make. And like this video, this was the result of the questions being asked in the comment sections. So please continue. It helps us to know what videos and what information we need to put out. And with that, I'm going to say Shalom.